Welcome to the second episode of Graz VR podcast series. Thanks for your support. Our podcast is being listened in over eight countries. Hi, this is Srinivasan, the founder of Squarecom Graz VR. Hi, this is Sriram, the co-founder of Squarecom Graz VR. This episode is about the evolution of virtual reality and a brief note on its genesis. Oh gosh, I nearly threw up. That was the reaction of Alfred Jennings, a publicity man for one of the leading gas company, after witnessing the demo of a motorcycle ride in Brooklyn traffic through Sensoroma, the world's first virtual reality system, way back in 1962. Sensoroma was one of the earliest virtual reality system created way back in 1962 by documentary filmmaker and cinematographer, Mr. Martin Heilig. He's also referred to as the father of virtual reality in many of books and articles. Wow. Are you serious? A virtual reality system in 1962? Yes. In fact, he started working on the virtual reality system in 1958 and completed the work on the first prototype in 1962. It has taken him a good four years. And the audio snippet that you just heard is a recreation of the 1962 demo. Of course, it may not be the exact actual recreation of it, but it's the best that which we could do. It even had the ability to produce smell and fragrance. The red chair you will be sitting at will rock back and forth, giving you a feeling of actually riding the bike. He even partnered with a couple of companies to produce the fragrance and smell of different flavors. That's mind blowing. What a visionary he was. Being able to do all of these in 1962 with such limited technological and computing powers. Exactly. Look at the audacity of his vision. We are 60 years past Sensoroma and still haven't been able to get virtual reality mainstream. While reading about him, I found out that he had the ambition of being an architect, but ended up as a cinematographer. But little did he know that he was the architect of a virtual future 60 or 70 years from his demise. Thanks to such visionaries. We are all able to build something out of it. Yeah, so true. As a matter of fact, he wasn't able to continue his research or the development further as he couldn't secure funds for his uh, project. He was a renowned filmmaker and cinematographer, though. He later even went on to work at Disney on uh, Thrillerama, a rear 3D projector that was so famous back then. Good that he was able to follow his passion. So funding has been an issue even then. Oh yeah, that will always be there 50 years from now and 50 years before. It's part and parcel of any entrepreneur's journey. So this is where the VR journey of the world started? Yeah, to the best of our research and documented materials, the original journey on virtual reality started in 1962. Better, it started in 1958 when uh, Martin originally started working on this system. And with the official launch of the prototype of Sensoroma, that is when the actual virtual reality journey of the world started. 
and as for the populist sentiment and the contrarian documents that we have it's not in the late 90s or it's not in the early 2000 or not with the launch of some of the latest virtual reality devices in 2016 or 17 it started way back in 1962 when we didn't have a personal computer in our home that is how old and continuously evolving the virtual reality technology is. That's indeed remarkable. I'm just thinking aloud here. Why do you think Martin Hailey would have want a virtual reality system at a time like 1960s, when the conventional cinema in itself wasn't so advanced? Well, from the documents we have come across on Martin Hailey, he was a pale, imaginative man, in his late 30s, he was already bored with the flat images on flat screens. He was even quoted as saying he wanted to make films that would look exactly like the world around him. I believe that's the main reason it drove him to work on an immersive virtual reality system that's thought to be an advanced tech even to this day. It was even more advanced than some of our current virtual reality devices. Even they haven't reached its potential. He did all of this with such a limited computing power and such a limited technological setup, and he could still come out with an, such an extraordinary system that we are discussing even to this day. But all that hard work didn't help him enough. You said he couldn't proceed further with the projects because of the want of fund. If the system was so desired by the people experiencing it, he would be able to be secure the funds, right? That's true. He was working with a film-based projection system. Mind that, he did all this even before personal computers were a thing and movies and theoretical experiences were all trying to pick up momentum. We are in 2021 and debating about effects and impact. Think about 1962 when this has to be a tangible value add to the users and the investors alike. That's a hardball to chew. Without an ounce of doubt, it's so clear that Sensoroma was way ahead of its time. Even the world famous the Atari Pong game was released in 1972, 10 years later Sensoroma. He wasn't just ahead of time, it was like a decade ahead of it. Eventually, the arcade game market was either limited or non-existent and came in 10 years after this. So it's obvious investors would be cautious and would be mindful about investing in a system like this. Moreover, all the startup and the venture capital ecosystems weren't mature enough like what we have today. So in conclusion, when we do an analysis of why it couldn't uh, succeed or it was not successful enough comparison to a virtual reality system like what we have today, it might be largely because of the timing. Again, all of this is not any uh, factual or evidence-based. Uh, I'm talking about the debate that we are having. It's mostly about the uh, a thesis of why it could have uh, went wrong. Uh, well, Martin Helix virtual reality system was like the smartphones of today, but in retrospect, in reality, people experiencing it weren't exposed to any of its predecessors like a landline telephone or a conventional mobile phone. That's one of the main reason it couldn't succeed, not because of its potential and not because of its capabilities and not because of its experience. You know, obviously, when you are coming out with a system like this, the initial or the basic prototypes and the early devices that come out they will always be limited in its scope and support. That is, again, a given thing uh, in any time, whether you release it in 2020 or 1960, that's a given. So it could be mostly because of the people experiencing it, not exposed to any of its basic functionalities or the other supportive elements that have to be there. Perfect. That's well thought out and insightful. Looks like modern is the first torchbearer of virtual reality. 
So what happened to the virtual reality tech after 1962? We had so many other evangelists of the technology and uh, several other torch bearers carrying the mantle. We are talking about metaverse and virtual world in 2021, but we had a navigable virtual world way back in 1977. It was produced by the renowned artist David M. for NASA's uh, Jet Propulsion Lab. It was called the Aspen Movie Map, wherein users could wander the streets of Aspen, the city in Colorado, which we are proudly going to call our home very soon. Looks like most of the ideas and experiences we have in virtual reality today had their seeds sown in the late 60s and 70s. Since you mentioned that, it sparks my interest as to the timeline required for a technology's evolution. Do you think we require such a long time for a technology to evolve? Well, not all the technologies go through such a strenuous timeline. With the case of virtual reality, there are several different misconceptions among the Gen Z of today on its inception and the evolution. That is why we wanted to clear as much of it as possible with this episode of ours. With respect to your question on the evolutionary cycle of VR, there are various different cycles in its phase. First, it was launched for a consumer experience. It was shelved and again picked up by the Defense and Space Agencies. And then it again tried to make its foray into the consumer world. It can't be written off or shelved into one particular niche. One of the main reasons I believe why there is a pendulum effect in its operational area is largely because of its complementary technological components. If VR has to succeed, it needs a strong complementary support from its other technological factors like display, computing power, optical capabilities, and so on. As the other elementary factors keep evolving, the potential and capabilities of virtual reality keeps evolving as well. And as VR keeps progressing, the use cases and its core focus areas, they keep changing and evolving too. So this has to be a continuous effect and it's going to be an evolutionary cycle for some more time as well. Check out prasvr.com to learn more about how VR can create a positive impact in the manufacturing and industrial sector. Quite interesting stuff. So virtual reality will keep evolving. Is that what you're saying? If so, when do we get to see VR devices take a significant market share in the consumer space? Well, that is not what I entirely mean. The VR for consumer market already registered 3.3 billion US dollars in 2019 and is expected to register 4.6 billion dollars by next year. This is just pure consumer market data as per Statista. This includes both the hardwares as well as the applications. And these numbers are taken without any of the current or the potential enterprise market value. And as you are aware, enterprise is the strong segment for virtual reality right now. So the point I'm trying to make here is that for virtual reality to play a key role in everyday user's life, it will take some more time. Maybe we will have to wait for VR and AR glasses to play a significant role in everyday user's life. And as per a recent report, an average Indian user spends 4.8 hours a day. You see that? 4.8 hours a day just using apps. And India ranks in the fourth place next to South Korea, which spends about an average of five hours a day. And US hasn't been in the top 10 of this uh, per hour usage list as well. This is the kind of a penetration VR devices will require to replace 
a device like smartphone and become the most and the promising or the primary computing device. So do you think we have such a firepower with our existing devices or even the complementary app ecosystem in the virtual reality and augmented reality technology to compete with this kind of a usage time? Is that even possible with the current scenario? Obviously not. With the current available hardware and software, you can't even take half of the time. So you have been saying that VR devices will evolve into the next computing device. How or when do you think it will happen? Okay. So let us take a hypothetical situation here. Most of the human beings don't have an issue wearing glasses all day. In fact, it's considered a style statement. But if you ask someone to wear a big head-mounted display and walk around town, it is both impossible and looks bizarre too. So when you have VR and AR glasses that have all the productivity tools, immersive entertainment, shopping and media meetings, etc., then that will have a seismic shift in the way business and work is carried out across the globe. Then it will have a far more cascading usage time than any of the computing devices we have come across thus far. This includes all the uh, conventional computers, PCs, laptops, smartphones, everything, smartwatch, everything together. Even the smartwatch that we have today are aimed at taking this usage time. So companies through multiple devices and multiple form factors are competing for the user's time. There is this attention span of your time. That's what they are craving for. When you have a single device that has the most immersive experience and the tools and applications, then the consumers are going to spend most of their time around it. That, I believe, will be the watershed moment of the virtual reality industry altogether. And that will be the ultimatum many of the companies operating in this field are trying to achieve as well. Having said that, what do you think is the most primary objective with which Grahas VR is striving to achieve with virtual reality? I come from an industrial and automotive background. It's mostly looked at as if technology and industries are two different extremes. In retrospect, they both go hand in hand. They complement each other very well. The manufacturing industry is one of the worst feared to lose the job by automation. When you mentioned skilling to the workforce with virtual reality, that too starting it off with the industrial sector that got me hooked in right away. We started with the vision of leveling up everyone's skill. That was creating a positive impact in the people's life and changing the world for me. End of the day, we are using technology to combat technology and hope the user always remains the supreme commander. That sounds great. It's rightly said that vision is the art of seeing the invisible. Hope our listeners got an idea about the potential of VR. Please do share your thoughts and feedback to us through mail or any of our social media handles. Thanks for listening. Please check out grazvr.com to reach out to us. If you like our show, please give us a five-star rating. Subscribe to Graz VR in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, or your favorite listening platform. Follow our social media handles to stay updated on the future episodes. Thank you.